Hi, I'm Andy Murray. Welcome to It's a Customer's World podcast. Now more than ever, retailers and brands are accelerating their quest to be more customer-centric. But to be truly customer-centric, it requires both a shift in mindset and ways of working, not just in marketing, but in all parts of the organization. In this podcast series, I'll be talking with practitioners, thought leaders, and scholars to hear their thoughts on what it takes to be a leader in today's customer-centric world. In this episode, I have with me Paco Underhill. Paco founded Enviracell in 1986 as a testing agency for prototype stores. Enviracell has worked in 46 countries and with more than half of the Fortune 50 list. Paco is also the author of the best-selling book, How We Buy, The Science and Shopping, which is out in 28 languages and is used in MBA programs, design schools, and retailing training programs across the world. During my talk with Paco, we discussed the importance of observation and understanding the customer experience and the knowledge that can be gained in retail innovation by visiting boots on the ground and learning from other countries. Hello, Paco. Welcome to the Customer Centric Leadership Initiative podcast uh, about uh, the customer world that we live in. It is such a privilege to have you on the show today. Uh, obviously, I've, from my shopper background, been a, a huge fan, and, and you've influenced a lot of the thinking that uh, the whole industry has benefited from for many, many years. And so, first, thank you for having the time to come and talk to me today. Andy, it is a privilege to be with you and to yet I again interact with the University of Arkansas and the Walton School of Business. Excellent. Well, we are going to get into some cool topics today because uh, it, there's never been a time, I think, where there's so many changes happening upon us that could create some great conversation. I think a lot of people would like to hear your thoughts, given your experience over the years in looking at retail spaces. And so if you kind of step back and look at the what's happened with COVID and you look at the physical space, you know, just reading today about Marks and Spencer's 7,500 jobs, uh, you know, it's a really challenging space for a lot of people. But from a big picture, 50,000 foot view, what, how do you describe what's going on with physical retail in stores and customer experience? Well, Andy, one of the things that's really important to understand is that the monster of consumption is intact. We need, we need to eat, we need to drink, we need to love our children, we need sheets and towels, we need gasoline, we need all of those things that, that keep life going. What is at risk and what is changing is that face of consumption. Mm. And that historically, you know, retail, particularly in the 20th century, has been about birth, life, death, and compost. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of compost out there now. And so, what, explain a little bit more about this word compost. That's, a, that's an interesting word. I think in this context, I'd like to hear you talk about that. Well, some of it is recognizing that there are fundamental changes in retail. Retail is a reflection of the evolution of us. That for all of the biological constants that I've written uh, about 20 years ago, right-handedness, butt brush, uh, evolution of eyes, all of that stuff, part of what we know is that what made a good store in 2000 mm -hmm. and what makes a good store in 2020 are different. And they are reflections of the evolution of us. And one of the reasons that you've mm. enjoyed your job and I've enjoyed mine is keeping track of what those evolutions are and yeah. recognizing there's both danger and opportunity. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because I think um, you think about some of the, of the um, things we started doing in practices because of COVID, all of a sudden contactless payments for those that had that on their roadmaps in the shopping stores, probably went from maybe a three year out to happening very, very short. It's like ex yeah. all of those core things that we would never have seen contactless be pressed this fast or, or I would love to hear your thoughts on cash. You know, where do you think cash and handling coins and how are you seeing some of those things play out? Well, as you, as you uh, probably know, Andy, that the evolution of payment issues has been much more accelerated 
in the Western European market mm. when merchants have been confronted, particularly by labor cost here. Yeah. And therefore, whether you're in at a, in a supermarket in Sweden or a supermarket in Germany or a supermarket in Italy, or certainly markets in, in Amsterdam, Amsterdam mm. that those processes have been eminently more accelerated and in a way looking mm. at self checkout here yeah. in the US even the technologies that are in use at Walmart and at my local stop and shop here in Connecticut trail the systems that were used used in are you being used in Europe right now by 15 years wow that that's amazing if you think of it um, you walk into a Swedish grocery grocery store. You mm -hmm. cart. You put the bags and maybe your kid and your pocketbook into the cart, and you pick up a scanner. You scan your card and you push the cart onto a scale, and the scale weighs your cart with your kid, your handbag, mm. and your bags in it. And then, as you move through the store, you scan you put stuff in the appropriate bag, and the scanner records the product, the price, and the weight. Wow. And then as you go to leave, you push your cart across a, another scale, and if the weight turns out to be correct, you scan your cart and you're gone. Wow, now that, that would also have a huge impact, I would think, on shrink, because some of the challenges with self-checkout is shrink. And the, uh, the weight thing, there's really probably no way around that one. No, I mean, it's, and it's, um, I think the I, idea that it calculates the weight of your handbag and factors in the weight of your kid. In fact, yeah. you get to pack your own, pack your own bags here. So there's a bag for, you know, you may bring an insulated bag for your, for your refrigerator or freezer goods, but it, it changes much of the dynamics. And is that going to come here? The answer is yes. The only question is when. You know, it's interesting. One of the things that I've found um, helpful with Envirocell is you always have these local stories across the globe from these innovators that are trying things and showing us, you know, what's the art of the possible. And as you think about uh, what's happening with COVID, and we're all having a kind of a more common experience now, um, I I'm wondering if we're going to see some of the things that are farther out and further behind start to get a little closer together as we all now have these shared concerns around whether it's touch and experience somewhat. Um, we, we, I wonder if we'll see some of these new store prototypes being a bit more common in some of the things they're trialing than what we've seen across the globe so far. Well, certainly, I think one of the responsibilities that you have, Andy, given your experience at ASDA mm -hmm. and for the Walton School of Business is to bring that international perspective in. And one of the things I have always admired about Walmart is that they have done a very nice job about harvesting the talent in the offshore enterprises and brought them back to Northwest Arkansas. Mm -hmm. And you know, Bentonville today is one of the more co small cosmopolitan communities that I've ever seen. And that's, that's a huge asset. But yes, whether it's looking at, you know, growing vegetables in the concourse of the mall the way they do in Shanghai, or whether it's recognizing that putting a supermarket and a shopping mall and an apartment building together makes an enormous amount of sense, and that there are people who would, will pay for the privilege of being able to shop in their uh, shop a supermarket in their bedroom slippers. Yeah. And that, that 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 model of being able to weigh what do I get from rent from the retailers versus what do I get from the rent from somebody who wants to live in closer proximity and get the convenience factor factored in is something that is a much more progressive model outside the U.S. than it is here. Much yeah. less, you know, Andy, is that if we go other places, the cooperation between public and private interest is eminently more developed. So mm. you could go to a shopping mall in South Africa, mm. and for more than 20 years, they've had a stadium for high school sports. 
built into the shopping mall, much less having a drive-in movie within the context of their parking lot, which is something Walmart is just talking about doing right now. Yeah, that's such a good point. And I can um, see that in the UK a bit where I felt like uh, Asda had a very strong, the local store uh, had what was called, have uh, what's called Community Champions. And they're, they're a colleague uh, and they their job is to connect into the local community. And the Asda store becomes a, a really important connector for the different charities and different pieces that come together in a real powerful way. And so I do think it probably country by country or maybe some regions, the, the role of that store in its community can be a bit different than it might be here or in other places. And it's, it's, it is something to, to think about uh, in terms of why it's so important to go out into the markets around the world and observe and, and see things for yourself because you, you can't just look at the store. You have to look at what's happening in the total culture in the community for these ideas to even make sense, right? I have an image which I have used in I would say at least a hundred lectures, which is of a halal meat section in a Walmart Canada store in a suburb of Toronto. Mm. And the point that I make there is that Walmart Canada has done a reasonably good job of recognizing that there are key segments that if you put a halal meat section into a select Walmart, that the Muslim community not only buys their meat there, but they buy their laundry soap and they buy their clothing and they do other things there too, that they're key aspects to it. But certainly, Andy, one of the issues in a post-COVID era is how do we get more local? Mm. One of the ways I've been characterizing it is just merchants need to get closer to the front door. Yeah. We used to have an adage that we would walk into a, branch bank or even an office building and the desk farthest away from the front door was where the person in charge sat. Hmm. That's not a great place to be. You know, you know I have a, uh, um, have you ever been to gallery furniture in Houston? Not, I've not been to that one in Houston. No, no, it is a eccentric one-off store, but doc, the, the owner of it, and it's a, it's, a, it's a significant enterprise, has a desk right by the front door. Mm. And he is very adamant that he, he will spend a certain number of hours every day, including Saturday and Sunday, with that desk right up at the front door where he can interact with people and people can interact with him. And certainly in a post-COVID era, one of my suggestions for retail management is that senior management needs to take one weekend a month and get out there on the floor and think standing up. That, that's, that's fantastic. You know, I've, I've got a couple of different questions that uh, I'm anxious to ask you because you've raised two topics here. One is where we think local and thinking local and how local versus national will play out, sure. you know, post COVID, because I think there's some real interesting uh, challenges with that, but it certainly feels like a national chain's got to really think harder about local um, and, and and how that works because we've almost experienced the pandemic, if you will, in a different ways locally, uh, and so that's kind of helped stores think a lot harder. And we've all now feel our communities are there, but but the other question I guess I want to really go after is this importance of observational research, and so. Uh, as uh, we were talking maybe before we got started, I love having the being connected to Walton College because you get great questions from students. And unfortunately, school's not in just yet as the recording of this, but Professor Molly Rapert, who leaves the marketing department, um, really is a very highly engaged learner, uh, teacher, and, and creates very interactive classes and courses. And so when she heard that, that you and I were gonna have this talk, she sent me a, a number of questions. I could tell now she's a, raz- a raving fan. But, but one, one of the questions that she asked that I want to uh, share with you is, is this. Bringing the concept of observation to the marketing industry served as the foundation for so many key brands today. For example, in our focus on the customer, observing that customer in real, to- in real store as opposed to just sending them on a survey, sending them a survey provides insights that we can't get any other way. 
What was your favorite aspect of that methodology? And why does observing the customer still remain critically important today? Now, I'll just add to that question, especially since today, we've got all this customer data and big customer databases that should give us loads of insights about how customers behave because you can just go look at the data, but still, that's not the same what you learn from observational methodology. So what's your thoughts on that? Well, first of all, when I stepped off into the world of research, uh, it's now been 40 plus years ago. There were two ways that people collected information. First was the tools of media, media research, which were surveys, focus, focus groups. You could do it in person. You could do it online. You could do it quantitatively. You could do it qualitatively. But one of the things that I knew as a student of environmental psychology is that what people say they do and what people actually do are often different. And I can remember early in my career following a family through their shopping trip to Walmart. And they were in the store for 40, 40 minutes. I was very careful not to intrude on them. But as they were packing their bags in the car, I went up to them. I introduced myself. I said, I'm can I ask you a few questions about your shopping trip? And the uh, amount of time that they reported spending in the store and my stopwatch time were distinctly different. They told me that they shot parts of the store that didn't exist. <laughs> and they said that they bought stuff that I knew wasn't in their shopping basket. And, and I don't think they were lying to me. I, and some of it may have been that they were telling me what they thought I wanted to hear. The second tool, and that's, that's observing here, is a very important way of getting at a certain level of truth. Second tool that people used is sales research. Yep. And it's a catalog of victories. And Andy, you and I know that understanding where you're winning is really Im important. Oh, yeah. But if you're a merchant, understanding where you're losing is one of the key aspects to being able to win victories. And one of the things which I've always maintained my research crews when they go into a store is please come back with things that we can do in two weeks or a month, things that we can do in two months and things that we can do next year. But if I can come back to a client and win quick, immediate victories, then getting them to buy into the bigger and larger concepts are eminently easy. Okay. 2020, collecting data is really easy. And many of the methods that we used 20 years ago in analog form, we can do digitally now. And Enviracell has a number of AI partners um, that we are dealing with, where we're dealing with, you know, in-store camera work, retail methodologies. And it's, it is very exciting, but it's a combination of, of big data and small data, okay? Mm -hmm. the, the key here isn't the size of the pile of data that you accumulate, it's the actionability that you get on the other side of it. We also know that in the broader world of retail, we are desperately looking, and this is whether I'm talking about physical retail or I'm talking about digital retail, is I am looking for a better combination of art and science. And that whether it's in physical retail, figuring out the traffic patterns or how do I bundle better, I mean, a bunch of different very key issues in terms of being able to be customer centric and focused and realizing what the anxiety levels are of somebody walking in the door. But it does also, when you think about how you organize an online presence, or you think about the visual merchant mer merchandising of what picture is and how the context of that picture that you have in an online shopping experience, the way it differs between how someone accesses it on their phone versus their tablet versus their laptop, much less what is the difference between how the novice shopper for that product and the experienced shopper for that product perceives the details of the image in terms of understanding the context of what their purchase is. And, you know, Andy, mm. part of what has been, is very poignant in a post-COVID world is that the 
challenge to the evolution of language and information that existed pre-COVID has been accelerated now. And that even at my age, I am asking my 19-year-old stepdaughter to be able to solve digital issues that I should understand, but I haven't. Mm. And that the, the recognition on the part of both merchants and some of the global technology firms that we work for, that digital literacy is in a state of evolution. And much of our digital edu education mm -hmm. up until recently has been largely ad hoc. And that one of the, one of the key aspects to this for physical merchants, okay, is that the line between the digital and the physical world doesn't exist anymore. And that whether I'm an Adidas or whether I'm a, a Macy's or whether I'm a Walmart, or whether I'm an ASDA or a Lidl, that one of the best places to teach somebody how to interact with me digitally is in store. Mm. How do we take that opportunity? That's one. Second is how do we recognize that I can teach the parent, but if I teach the child, that is often a really clever way and an easy way of being able to teach the parent. To. And this is this is a, a really exciting time. Wow. Well, and, and you think about it, uh, restaurants recently, a lot of them, because of the touch challenge, has started using QR codes. And QR codes, as you know, have been around 20 years, I think. And I remember trying to do a QR code project probably six years ago at Walmart on using their tabs of QR codes. And part of the pushback was customers don't, well, they just won't use that. It's too technical, whatever. But today, um, you see QR codes in, in physical retail spaces, and pretty much it's pretty a quickly adapted technology. Uh, you know, it's just how fast that's happened with probably two or three months. People are pretty familiar with QR codes. Menus have QR codes. They don't have to have a physical menu, right? You don't have to touch it. That's a good example, I think, if you're, you're seeing this happen, the digital physical in that space at the same time. I think it's also key here that one of the, one of the sad re realities of our digital design world is that most of the designers mm -hmm. sitting at their CAD CAM screens are under age 30 and they're yep. designing for their eyes. And the way they see and the way Andy, you and I see are different. If I'm in China, we know that money is in the hands of younger consumers. Mm -hmm. But if I'm in Western Europe or I'm in North America, being able to recognize that um, the way I see at my age and the way someone sees at 30 is different and that there are often just some very important tuning to be able to do to whether it's a menu design or menu organization that makes an instant difference in terms of what the size of the order and the comfort level of the customers are. And this is, I, I, again, from the stand standpoint of that art and science of design, mm -hmm. makes this a really interesting and uh, mm -hmm. dynamic time. What, one of the things you talked about was language and how language hasn't kept up. And if you kind of look at a couple things here, one, the digital physical people in, in organizations coming close together because the omni channels coming closer together. Uh, product management, I've worked in the digital space, product management's a pretty common way to look at things, but in a physical retail, a product manager isn't really understood from a language standpoint yet. I mean, it's, so there's two different ways of looking at it. Product management is quick, lots of experiments, you're trying to do you know, a lot of testing with customers to learn things. Now, if you're in store prototype area, that's pretty common to be thinking a bit that way. But, but for the large part, that's pushing some language challenges together. And uh, what, what I found really difficult at times is selling in a new customer experience idea to more senior levels to get funding and support you really have to work on the language and, and simplify it and clarify it. And uh, back to Professor Molly Rapert, she, one of the questions she had uh, that I want to ask about is you use memorable terminology to describe phenomenon uh, to do that was groundbreaking, she felt. Uh, 
moving marketing away from the uh, ambiguity of academic terms by selecting terms that clearly tell the marketing exec executive what it means. For example, butt brush factor, uh, the decompression zone. Okay. Uh, and so her question is basically, those are really effective. How did you come up with those concepts of language uh, and, and label that? Because it does help paint pictures inside an organization to, to make what could seem a complex art uh, into something people can really put their head around quickly. Andy, I have a confession for you. I have never taken a business course in my life. Oh, okay. <laughs> Why, that is a confession. I wouldn't have thought that. <laughs> uh, I got into business completely by accident. I backed in. I, I made so many mistakes, some of them over and over again, including mistakes I'm making, you know, in my own practice right now. That said, I have always been a storyteller. And I have enjoyed writing books hopefully not to show how smart I am, but to do books that are enjoyable to read. And part of what has been astonishing for me is that there are books that I wrote 20 years ago, and I've, they've, they've been touched up and reissued and whatever, but some of them are still selling today, you know, 60, 70,000 copies here and are used in business schools all across the world. And Part of the reason why they're used is just because they're easy, fun, informative reads. And somebody walks away going, I will never look at the world the same way having read this book. Yep. And, you know, a uh, butt brush may go on my tombstone, whether I like it. <laughs> Well, it, it is so, it's so clear. It, but it does sound like a word that came from observation. I mean, it, it, you kind of come back to, you see it happen, and it's something there It's deep uh, to what, what you're seeing happen. You're going to get that out of data. You know, I am deeply grateful that in the late 1970s and early 1980s, uh, the Federated Building Executives Committee, which was the heads of store planning for all of the Federated uh, mm. department stores, opened up Bloomingdale's in Boston, Filene's in, or Bloomingdale's in New York, Filene's in Boston, and said, Paco, please come in and do whatever you want to, okay? And if you find something out that you think is interesting for us, you know, tell us. And I am perennially grateful for their, their acceptance of a, you know, interested, you know, researcher coming in and invading their turf. And I can remember just watching the time-lapse movies of somebody shopping a tie counter at Bloomingdale's and recognizing that every time they got brushed from the rear, they moved on. And going back and going, we don't even have to change the counter. Let's just put a, a chair at the counter to create a little shelter for somebody doing it. And then the head of store planning coming back to me and saying, Paco, we have been tracking sales off that fixture and sales have gone up, you know, four times just in the day that you did it. And this is, this is part of what I found is that if you can win victories, it doesn't matter whether you speak MBA speak, um, that's what people want is victories. And part of what is clear for you and your students at the Walton School of Business is that that focus on winning victories is looking at that combination of art and science. And it made sense in 1981 in the aisles of Blooming, Bloom, Bloomingdale's. It makes sense today, whether you're talking about a physical or a digital presence. One of the things that you talk quite a bit about and have always uh, been an evangelist for is design and this area of design. And I think when you look at customer experience and trying to improve it, for some people, I think there's a mental block that we can't afford that, that that's going to be expensive. Yet your example of the tie counter um, by just a simple, small change could greatly affect things. And, and I've been a believer that great design isn't about cost. Uh, it, it's and it's and I think we 
we trick ourselves or trap ourselves to then maybe not take progress. And I, I love that the, the, the things you can do in two weeks is a, two weeks is a very agile uh, way of thinking in terms of getting to that customer experience with those small things. And is it, do you still believe today, and it's true today, that we can make a lot of improvements in customer experience without spending a lot of money in some cases because it is still sometimes those simple things in design that we just overlook? One of the things which I really like uh, about doing research on websites is that we can work with a web D, D, D design team and meet every, every week and come up with a series of quick and easy experiments that whether they work, we know it instantly. Yeah. Okay? Um, and that crossover here, I think, is interesting. Just, Andy, two things here to be very uh, cognizant of. We at in Viracell have almost a 35-year history testing prototype stores. If you think of the 25 largest merchants in the U.S., we have done some proto prototype testing for more than two-thirds of them. Okay, wow. and one of the key aspects to it is that if you have a prototype that succeeds 100%, it's a bad proto prototype because you haven't looked to stretch the envelope. Wow. And that um, stretching that envelope is one of the ways in in which you learn. That you learn from winning, but you also learn from understanding where you're losing and why. Mm. Second issue here, which I think is a very interesting one, is that um, the commercial design industry, to my at my obser- observation has been one of the last creative professions to be gender integrated. Hmm. It is really hard to find a senior store planner, female, who's over age 50. Hmm. Today, the profession is much more gender integrated and that the interest in collaborative design is eminently more with us today than it was even 10 years ago. And I think that's very exciting. One of the very nasty truths of the commercial design and the retail design industry is that up until 2010, a remarkable number of prize winning stores were closed a year after they opened because the critics loved them and the public did. Yep. And wow. you know what? we need to get closer to the public and we need to get closer to the realities of what people need and what people want and how people see and how people move. Well, it's interesting to talk about prototypes and how that has all changed. I've been around in this industry since 91, and there certainly was a, a, an era of keep them in the store longer because they'll buy more. Uh, and boy, we saw store formats, didn't we, that had all the things you needed for a quick trip. They didn't understand that that trip, there was a time budget. You you got a money budget, a time budget, and a frustration budget. And if you're gonna exhaust those budgets because you want them in the store longer, and that was such a powerful thought that was influencing store prototypes and concepts for a while. Uh, In my opinion is it feels like maybe in the last 10 years, a lot of the prototypes I've seen are a bit more around operational metrics, efficiency, making those stores run better, get more, more sales per square foot, perhaps, uh, those kind of key objectives. But what are you seeing and what do you think the briefs are going to be now? And as okay. they go forward, how much do you see it being weighted towards, you know, more efficiency out of space versus better customer experience? I think there, there are several issues, Andy. First of all, that the union between store, aisle, shelf, and package is being rethought as we think now. Second is that there are some basic ways in which we organize the store that are rooted in the 20th century that need to be rethought. And it's everything from maybe organizing based on meal group to organizing a uh, apparel section based on size as opposed to style. Um, That said, one of the other issues in a post-COVID world is that our radar for hygiene Mm. has been acutely uh, affected. And one of the issues that we are asking 
we asked it pre-COVID and we're asking it post-COVID, is when in the design process are you factoring in keeping it clean? Hmm. I have a um, interesting Soriano, a Mexican uh, supermarket chain, and I can remember visiting them several several years ago. And one of the things that management told me then is that when they started moving store cleaning from only happening after hours to happening all during the day. So that as somebody pushed their carts through, they saw somebody cleaning the front of the refrigerator and the freezer cases, that their scores for store cleansing cleanliness based on the same same money that they were spending on on store hygiene, but their scores went up because people saw it. Saw it. And Brilliant. I I you know um if you ask me where is some of the best super supermarkets on the planet, I would go, you know, I really like taking people through Mexico City because there are mm. a lot of really, really good stuff going on there. But I I think that that hygiene question. And certainly we also know that one of the most important factors over the past 10 years has been supply chain management. Yeah. And there isn't a big box merchant out there that isn't looking to shrink the footprint of the store because I can fit the same number of SKUs in, but I could shed 20 to 30% of the space. And the question becomes, what do I do with that 20 or 30%? I can understand that. One of the things that I've realized at ASDA is the, uh, customer expectations can change quickly and have a dramatic effect on store design, whether it's single use plastic, for example, in produce, as you know, in the, in the UK, it's a bit more packaged produce and such for lots Mm -hmm. of reasons, mostly because it does help reduce waste uh, and shelf life in in the pantry and such. But, but the public um, focus on plastic was so, uh, so high and, and very uh, active and very, very vocal um, that, that you really, you really couldn't sit there and debate the topic. You just needed to move and just start getting rid of plastic in some pretty profound ways uh, that it, it just society moved us there pretty quickly. And, and I think that's probably going to be true with hygiene where, you know, it's just where we're at today that the customer is ahead of us sometimes, aren't they in the, what they want out of something, and it's getting easier for them to tell you what they want. Well, I think that's also that they have choices here, and that's really what is is for our society is both scary for the merchant and progressive for uh, for the state of our species here. Um, I'm I'm working on a new book right now for Simon and Schuster called "The Future of Eating and Drinking." Nice. And one of the things that we're looking at is, you know, for example. Once we reach age 40, roughly 80% of our weekly purchases are the same thing. Mm. Why do I either have to go back to a store or why do I have to have it in a package that is designed to scream from the shelf rather than fit into my kitchen or fit into my green consciousness? Is there a better way of doing it? And as we talk to people in the larger packaging design community, part of what they're asking is it is one thing to be recycled it's another thing to be repurposed and is there a way of taking product packaging and rather than recycling it repurposing it in some way that that makes sense whether it's you know the box that you come in is actually turns into animal feed that you can feed your chickens i'm mean, I mean, stuff like that yeah it's, May may sound absurd, but you know, being able to make a box out of you know animal feed or, or seeds or something is is could be eminently sustainable. Or it's the degree to which there are certain product categories that maybe I buy by subs- subscription, and therefore it comes to me in some recyclable sack which goes into a container in my laundry room, as opposed to the plastic container, which I have now. I mean, those are all things which we see examples of in other parts of the world. You go to an Israeli super, 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 super supermarket and milk and um, laundry soap and other things are, are given to you in a much more ecological form. And I think part of what could be really cool 
for uh, you guys in your program is to start doing an active job of collecting what those global in a in a innovation. Well, it's, it's really interesting. Um, I agree with you. I don't know if you followed what TerraCycle is doing with this program called Loop. We're basically taking uh, and creating a durable package instead of a single use package for a lot of different SKUs right. and then having a refill cycle. I know Tesco's trialing it uh, for exclusive trial for six months. I know Kroger is doing it here. Uh, but that, that's got an interesting business model on it that could completely make you rethink the package for package brands. Okay. Do you know, uh, did you ever know Charlie, Charlie Zimmerman? Uh, the name's familiar. Yeah, he was the head engineer for Walmart. He yeah. worked at Walmart uh, domestic for many years, Walmart international, but one of the more dedicated and interested um, retail environmentalists that I have ever met. And he lives in Bentonville. He's retired mm. now. I would, uh, I would recommend asking him to come in and do some lectures and programs for you because the work that he did at Walmart in terms of lowering the energy uh, profile of the Walmart building is some of the most progressive work I have ever seen. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, definitely have to talk to him because I think that's where the world's headed and it's, it's not slowing down on that front at all. Uh, one of the other questions uh, Professor Molly Rapert asked is, who inspires you? You've been inspiring people to think differently about all of these spaces, but who do you look for and how do you get inspired uh, to stay on the cutting edge of this? Well, um, first of all, um, I, I'm, I'm still an active reader. Can you read this? This is yes. The Fall of the Human Empire, which is uh, by a French author, um, who is writing the memoirs of a robot in, in 2050 uh, about what the, what the former world of humans looked like before the robots took over. I think it's a, it's a oh, fun great. Movie. But I have a couple of people that I follow. There is David, Dr. David Bossart, who's the executive director of GDI, the Gutlieb Duttweiler Institute yep. in Zurich, who is, um, has a, is PhD in political political science, but GDI is a retail consumer focused agency. And he's, he's a very interesting guy because he brings political and macroeconomic issues into the, into the mix. And being someone who is outside the US, his vision about what's going right and what's going wrong in, the Western Hemisphere, I, I think is always very interesting. I have another uh, a colleague who teaches at the IESC, the Spanish Business School in uh, Barcelona. Mm -hmm. He uh, has his PH, PhD from the Harvard Business School, Jose Luis Nueno. He <laughs> sits on the board of a number of major uh, Spanish uh, retail agencies, and he's just a wonderful contrarian, you know. Uh, smart, funny, irascible. Um, I I just love listening to him talk. Well, it's interesting in that same. I think in that same school, uh, Luis Martinez Ribes. I don't know if you know him, but does quite a bit of work in the, in Barcelona on experiential. And he was a guy I would call to say, "I'm coming to Spain. Can you set me up some interesting store prototypes to see and what's happening in the future?" And I don't know what it is in Barcelona, but they're they're really pushing some of those prototypes and have some really good retail thinking. I think. I I, I have a thesis here, uh, Andy, and you know it it isn't based in knowledge or fact. It's just based in observe, observation, which is that the countries that have centers have a difficult time exporting retail. Hmm. So if you think about France, everything that happens in France happens in Paris. You think about Japan, everything that happens in Japan mm -hmm. that's of interest happens in Tokyo. Same thing is true of the UK, everything is in London. But Spain has no center. Italy has no center. And those are places where the innovations of Zara and Mango and the broader um, retail design community have been very telling. The Spaniards have been 
seminal in the reinvention of the design of the airport mm. and the design of the hospital. And those are, those are all things where, I, again, it's a matter of looking, seeing, processing, and, uh, you know, trying to be contrary. Yeah. Do you like well, to the airport? Well, in a, well, I haven't been to the airport. Obviously, the cathedral, uh, Familia, uh, is pretty pretty strong, uh, uh, gouty, 100-year project to think about design. It's not just even short-term, but even long long-term big design projects like airports and cathedrals. Uh, what, what kind of psych psychotropic drugs were, was Gaudi doing, you know, 120 years ago? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. I, I would hate to see his business pitch and how that worked out, but uh, yeah, exactly. Um, speaking about learning, and we'll kind of go toward, toward the end here with students, and you know, a lot of students are coming into their a business school, whether it's the Walton College or other business colleges, and they're seeing this space and they're reading a lot, probably hearing a lot about the customer experience and, you know, that. A any thoughts on, on how a student might approach um, being a, 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 becoming an expert or building a career in this space that, that really does look at that customer experience inside an organization? Okay. If I were coaching a business school student at the Walton School of Business today. I would say, you know, take your courses, but I would also recommend acquiring another language. Okay. Interesting. And that historically, in the world of business, you got through your Harvard Business School, you went to corporate headquarters, and you made your way up through the ranks. I think one of the ways to prove yourself quickly and to gain experience is to go elsewhere, okay? Yeah. And that is, if you want to work for Walmart, go work at Walmart India or China or Walmart Mexico or Brazil. And that part of what you'll find is that your learning curve is higher, your exposure rate is better, and that the accelerant to your career is you're going to get places faster, and um, maybe even have a little more fun doing it. Well, I can speak from experience. The international assignment I took in the UK for four years completely, and I thought I knew a lot about retail. I knew nothing about retail once I got to see it in a different context and a different culture and, and the different competitive environment, and I couldn't agree with you more. There's a lot of power in that. Uh, some, some people talk about customer journey skills and customer experience skills, and and as I've asked this question, what is the one thing you could learn? And I, I love the idea of international because you can't unsee what you see internationally. It just changes you. But the power of empathy. And, and some will say you've got to really, um, and if you can learn one thing, learn how to be empathetic. Um, that does tie a little bit to what you're talking about in terms of observation and having empathy. And so do, as you guys look at it in EnviroCell, do you guys talk about empathy and the importance of empathy in change in the way you think about this space? This is what I recommend, is that we have gotten all too comfortable learning by staring into our screens and thinking sitting down. And that one of the keys to uh, our education is learning how to think standing up. I am reminded of my interactions with the Israeli Defense Forces, who say that battles are won when generals get to the front lines. Mm. Okay, and that experience of being able to get out there and see, look, and process is in part about learning empathy, but it's also uh, about having a tactile, real understanding of what is going on at that point of intersection and rubber sole shoes and spending a little time on the front lines, I think is very valuable. Uh, for those that are on a podcast, you won't know this, but uh, what Paco did was hold up his shoe and showed me what the answer was. And so that'll kind of give you a case you're wondering what, what was going on there for that pause. But uh, I love that idea. I love the idea of getting out, get away from the screens and go see the world in its context of what's really happening. Uh, and I'm, I'm a huge believer of that that's a great insight. 
Uh, anything else, Paco, you want to share? This has been fantastic. What a great conversation. We've covered a lot of good areas. Well, thank you, uh, Andy. Please give my regards to Molly, to, to Molly Raper. Yep. And thank her for her uh, eye attention and contra contribution. And I hope that at some point in the not too distant future that uh, we can be um, having the same conversation in Fayetteville and talking to your students. Thank you very much for having oh, me. We would love, we love for that to happen. Thank you so much for doing this. So much. Thank you, Paco. All right, bro. You've just listened to an insightful conversation with Paco Underhill. We learned that one of the most important things when understanding the customer experience is observation. The best way for students to gain experience in this field is in the front lines and how the pandemic accelerated innovation in retail, but yet we still have a lot to learn. Check out the show notes to find out more about his newest book with the working title of The Future of Eating and Drinking, available in 2021. And thank you for listening to this episode of It's a Customer's World. That's it for this episode of It's a Customer's World. If you found this helpful and entertaining, I would be so grateful if you could share our show with your friends. And I'd be super happy if you subscribe so you can be updated as we publish new episodes. And if you really want to help, leave us a five-star rating and a positive review on Apple Podcast or wherever you listen. It's a Customer's World podcast as a product of the University of Arkansas Customer-Centric Leadership Initiative and a Walton College original production.